XK2303. Hello, I'm Richard Sherman, and it's just wonderful to be back here on Cherry Tree Lane. You know, actually, my brother Bob and I worked on Mary Poppins for three years, helping to shape the story, and we wrote all the songs. My brother Bob is living in London. Hello from London. Now, this is what you might call a fortuitous circumstance, because now we're going to see some things you've never seen before and hear some music you've never heard before. So come on, follow me. A bit of magic? It's easy. Let's see. You think, you wink. You know, early on, when we were working on this sequence, we were going to have Bert do a little musical turnaround. It sort of went, you think, you blink, you do a double wink, you click your heels twice in the air, and quick as a tick, you're there. And then they would jump into the picture. And it wasn't used because Walt said it wasn't necessary, that we had plenty of music coming up in the Jolly Holiday sequence. But uh, we can go on our own Jolly Holiday, so come on with me. Well, oh, I know where we are. The uh, Tea Pavilion is right over there. Come on. This is where Bert and Mary stop for tea. <laughs> That's before the Disney magic was added. You know, this is where that wonderful dance took place with Dick Van Dyke and the Penguins. You know, actually, I played the kazoo. Erwin Kostel heard a demo I had done, and he loved it so much, he said, I want you to play with the orchestra. So after the orchestra was dismissed, I went into the booth and did the kazoo part. By Disney magic, I happened to have a kazoo in my hand. And I'll give you a little sample of what it went like. <laughs> That's what it sounded like. XK90. The lady's voice that you hear is Evelyn Kennedy. She edited all the music together. We sped the tape up to make it sound sillier and fit in with the orchestra. And that was how I made my debut as a symphony kazooist. During the course of development of the film, we wrote something like 32 songs. 14 were used in the picture, and later, we're going to hear one that almost made it, but not quite. We didn't have a script when we started working on Mary Poppins. All we had was this wonderful book by Pamela Travers, and uh, we were taking chapters and developing them one at a time. Mary Poppins, in one of the chapters, takes a, a compass and has the children spin it. And uh, we wrote songs for each one of the places where the compass landed. We had a song called The Land of Sand. We actually used that melody in Jungle Book. Years later, we wrote a song called Trust in Me for Ka the Snake to sing. As a matter of fact, Bob and I did an interview a few years ago, and the compass sequence was one of the things we talked about. One of the times that they spun the compass, they wound up at the bottom of the beautiful briny sea. And the entire sequence was cut, so that song lay dormant. Seven years later, we were working on a project called Bedknobs and Brewsticks. It was again with Don DeGrotti and Bill Walsh. And Bill called us up one day and said, uh, look, fellas, you have a song that's perfect for Bedknobs that we never used in Mary Poppins. And that's how... How pleasant bobbing, bobbing along, bobbing along on the bottom of the beautiful briny sea. What a chance to get a better peep at the plants and creatures of the deep, etc. <laughs> and the song we wrote for the, at Enchanted Island with the tiki torches would dance that was called Tiki Town. We're flying, of course! In Tiki Town, when the sun goes down in the shimmery South Sea Isles, meet the tiki moon, all the tiki soon light up in great big smiles. One and that little tune wound up melody, in another sweet, song, but I'll talk zip, about that later. Zip, zip, zip. Pamela Travers, as great a writer as she was, she really was not experienced in the motion picture art. 
And I remember she kept saying, why don't you use Tara Rabumdie? I like that song. We said, well, we like it too, but it's an original musical, Mrs. Travis. And then she said, why don't you use Green Sleeves? I love Green Sleeves. Mrs. Travis, we love Green Sleeves too, but it's not an original song for the film. Later on, we did use a little flavor of that. Well, here we are at the racetrack. And actually, the racetrack was where we did the Pearly song, which was actually supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Pearlies are the musicians that play at these wonderful sporting events. They're all dressed up in pearl buttons sewn onto their costumes in beautiful decorative designs. And it's a great English tradition. But at any rate, producing that song was quite a bit of a chore. To get a professional to sound like an amateur is very, very difficult. Now here's something you haven't heard before. This is the individual instruments playing as the pearly band. We had to record each instrument separately and then put them all together. And you do that with very precise timing. It's called a click track, which is the rhythm track, which is put in earphones for the musicians to hear. You hear that click and you play your music into that rhythm. Even the voices were separated. It's super califragilistic, expialidocious, even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. We had Julie singing, and we had Dick singing, and then we had the, the um diddlers in the background, them singing also. So we had quite a bit of separation to make this simple little song. We call this song the Pearly Song, and Walt was the one that said, don't be afraid to call it supercalifragilistic. Get out of here. We wrote the song Admiral Boom early on because we thought he was such an entertaining character. And Walt felt that it wasn't necessary to give Admiral Boom a number to tell the story. A song should be necessary to the picture to really make it stay in the picture. And that's one of the things we learned by working on Mary Poppins. But Erwin Kostel, our wonderful musical director, thought the melody was good enough to use as the theme, the leitmotif for Admiral Boom. And actually, one of the lines in the song wound up in the picture as a piece of dialogue. The old world takes its time from Greenwich, but Greenwich, they say, takes its time from Admiral Boom. Who in the Royal Navy established that rigid time, that firm and flexible interval known as T? Admiral Boom! <laughs> time has been my watchword, punctuality. Though the world takes its time from Greenwich, Greenwich takes its time from me. Admiral Boom, 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 boom. The name for punctuality you may safely assume, safely assume, soon, 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 soon. soon, 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 soon is known throughout the Admiralty. It's me, Admiral Boom. Ellen, it is now eight o'clock. Of course, the song never made it into the film. But well, the melody did. did. Coo -a, a sight, thanks to Peter Ellenshaw. Well, now we're in for a treat. We're gonna hear some special cues that were written for the film but not used. Erwin Kostel used Chim Chim Cheree as the march when they're up on the top of the rooftops, and we felt it might need a little brighter tune, so we used Spoonful of Sugar eventually. But this is the cue that Erwin wrote originally. XK962, take one. Thank you. 
This short scene was cut after a preview screening. Come along, Michael. Now here's a really rare outtake. This is Julie as Mary Poppins yodeling to get the special staircase, that little smokestack staircase to form. And it wasn't used, and it's a bit of an outtake, but it's fun. You want, you want to take a look at this one. <laughs> XK2042. Perhaps I was a little out of character for Mary Poppins. You know, Erwin Costell, the brilliant arranger, conductor of our film, actually scored the entire fireworks sequence. It's an amazing feat of orchestration and creativity when Admiral Boom's guns go off. You hear Admiral Boom's theme. When you focus then on Mary Poppins, you hear Mary Poppins' theme. And all the while, Step in Time is pulsing away behind you. Walt made a decision later on that sound effects would be more effective, so we lost it. But here, for the first time, you're going to hear the actual scoring as the orchestra played the fireworks sequence. Gun ready, sir. Stand by. I always wanted to do this. Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. You know who finally wound up doing the whistling? Julie. Julie did the whistling for the bird. We had a, we actually had a uh, professional whistler come in and do some of it, but when Walt heard it and everything, it didn't have the personality. And Julie said, oh, I can do it. She's a great whistler. <laughs> we did record a version, it wasn't used, for the bird, singing the last line. In the most delightful way. The spoonful of sugar came from the various songs that we wrote for Mary Poppins to start with. Measure Up was a little rhythmic piece that we were going to have when Mary Poppins measures the children. But Walt felt it was not necessary. The right side was uh, Michael gets up on the wrong side of the bed and he's being rambunctious and acting up and Mary Poppins says, some days the left side is the right side, some days the right side is the right side. She's singing about a good attitude. All these songs led, actually, to our concept of writing an attitude song for Mary Poppins, because that would be her statement. There was a little song that we wrote called West Wind, and it was kind of a plea, please don't take me yet, I still have a lot of work to do. A very sweet song, wound up in another picture, it wound up in Big Red, Mon Amour Perdu, a love song. There's a little song called Mary Poppins' Melody that Mary Poppins sang when she was first meeting the children, and we used that as the, the strong melody line and wrote a counter melody to it called Stay Awake to be sung later as a lullaby. And everybody seemed to cotton to that second song, Stay Awake. So Mary Poppins' melody never really made it into the film, but Stay Awake became part of the score. Mary Poppins was the longest movie Walt Disney had ever made, and in some theaters, probably in London, it actually played with an intermission, as we see in this rare print. But don't go to the kitchen, because we've got one more stop to make. <laughs> You're just being here, and Uncle Albert makes me laugh. 
<laughs> well, now that we're up here, let me tell you about that song that was almost made it into the picture, but not quite. It was cut the day before we were going to record it. It's right here in my traditional musician's trunk. Let's see now. Here it is. No, 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 no. Oh, that's Votes for Women. That reminds me of Sister Suffragette, which reminds me of the song we wrote for Mary Poppins called Practically Perfect in Every Way, in Everything I Do, in Everything I Say. You know the tune now because it's Sister Suffragette. So cast off the shackles of yesterday. Let's see what we have now. Let me just, just oh, here, here. Oh, look at this. Look at him, look at him. Oh, this is the parrot handle umbrella. You know, we were going to have him talk all through the film. Walt said, no, let's just save it for the last scene. Is that so? You know who the voice was? David Tomlinson. He did the voice of the parrot. Oh, really? Yes, really. Well, let's see what we have now. Oh, let me see. Oh, this is a good book. This is a good book. This is about Bob and me. It's a very good book. I recommend it. And then we have, oh, look at this. This, is, this really brings up a story, a stick and string. You know, our father, he used to make kites for us when we were little boys. And toward the end of the film, we were trying to think of something that the father could do that was more thrilling and exciting than Mary Poppins. So here's a bit of the original version of the song that we wrote that was inspired by our dad. Could I have a piano, please? Now here, it went like this. With sticks and paper and strings, you can have your own set of wings. And when Walt heard the song, we finished it, and he said, that sounds like a Broadway show. It doesn't sound like my English musical style song. So we said, OK, Walt, we'll figure it out. We changed it to a three-quarter time English waltz. With tuppence for paper and strings, you can have your own set of wings. Well, enough of that. Let's see. Now, we have to find the song we're looking for, and this is the song. It's the Chimpanzee. I remember very, very well. This song actually was born out of two other songs. We wrote a song called Timbuktu, where the animals moo and all that kind of thing, and it wasn't good enough. So then we wrote Tiki Town, but we threw out the entire compass sequence. So we were stuck with this lovely little tune, and we decided to write a song for Mary Poppins to sing to the children at Uncle Albert's house. If you'll just stop behaving like a pack of laughing hyenas. <clears throat> Two lumps, Uncle Albert? Yes, please. <laughs> the children started getting rambunctious and laughing and floating around in the air like they do in the sea. But we thought that Mary Poppins would say, now there's enough of that. I don't want you to have to go to the chimpanzee. And they say, there's no place called the chimpanzee. And of course she says, on the contrary, and she sings about it. Now this whole scene was developed but the day that the recording was about to happen, uh, it was canceled. Walt felt it wasn't going to help the picture any to have that sequence. He felt that the sequence was too long. So he just cut it down to telling crazy jokes with Uncle Albert and, and Bert, and then they float down to the floor again and go home. It's time to go home. <laughs> oh, that oh, is no. sad. Oh, that's sad. That's the saddest thing I ever heard. We've actually found the original concept art and the storyboards. So now we'd like to render it for you for the very first time. In Timbuktu, there's a chimpanzee that's run by a chimpanzee. It's an oddish place where the human race is under lock and key. And on their backs, they wear small plaques for the animals to view, which specify the reasons why they're locked in the chimpanzee. If you're boisterous and bumptious, you're grist for the chimpanzee. If you're overly rambunctious, you're whisked to Timbuktu. Loss, loss, nothing but loss, but you know who's laughing at who. It's the animals there who giggle and stare at you in a chimpanzee. You may never.
ever play the music halls in all your wildest dreams. But Billow and Blast and the Chimpanzee and the animals burst their seams. It takes a lot of talent and time to become a West End attraction. But in this place, one rude grimace gets a marvelous reaction. Laughs, laughs, nothing but laughs, but you know who's laughing at who? It's the animals there who giggle and stare, gape with glee incredulously at the boisterous, bumptious, rowdy crew. At you in the chimpanzee. Always leave them laughing, they say. Thank you. We had a lovely time.